Good day grade 11s. Welcome to this next lesson on electric circuits. In this lesson we're going to be learning about Ohm's law. So let's join the Mindset Learn team that teaches us about Ohm's law and then I'll be talking, talking to you afterwards about the difference between ohmic and non-ohmic conductors. But first let's learn what Ohm's law is. <laughs> Good day grade 11s. In this lesson we are going to investigate Ohm's law. So far we have learned about the concepts of current, resistance and potential difference. Let's check the relationship between them in a lab. Today we will do an experiment to see how potential difference and current that passes through a resistor are related to each other. Here we have a simple circuit containing one resistor, a direct current power supply, an ammeter and a voltmeter. We will steadily increase the current through the resistor and measure the potential difference across the resistor as the current changes. We must ensure to keep a fair test. Therefore, all factors that may affect current, namely type of material and temperature, must be kept constant. When carrying out this experiment, we will make sure that the resistor does not heat up. We will allow current to pass through the resistor only for a very short while so that the resistor remains at room temperature. What I've done is taken a series of readings for current and potential difference by increasing the current through the resistor by 10 milliamperes at a time. I've then taken those readings and recorded them on a table. But before I show you this table, let me illustrate to you how I actually obtained those readings. I'm now going to turn the dial of my DC power supply up so that the current passing through the resistor is measuring 10 milliamps. Here is my voltmeter reading. I've set my voltmeter on the 10 volt scale and we can see now that the needle is lying at the 1,5 volt mark. I'm sure you all saw how we took those readings. Now I'm going to go to my table and show you the readings that I actually collected. My first reading of 10 milliamps, I recorded 1,5 volts. My next reading of 20 milliamps, I obtained a reading of 3,0 volts. 30 milliamps gave me 4,3 volts. 40 milliamps gave me 6,2 volts. And my last reading of 50 milliamps gave me a reading of 7,6 volts. Let's now use these results to plot a graph to establish the relationship between potential difference and current. Have a look over here. Here is my graph to show the relationship between potential difference and current. Do you notice that I've plotted the potential difference values on the y-axis and the current values on the x-axis? On each of these axes, I've set up a very clear scale. And I've then plotted the points on the graph according to the scale. Do you see that the graph that is now plotted is a nice straight line? This shows us that as the current increases, so the potential difference is also increasing. Therefore, we can now say that potential difference is directly proportional to the current that flows through the resistor. There is another way we can confirm these findings. What we can do is to calculate the ratio of the potential difference to the current using the results we obtained in the experiment. But before we can do that, we must make sure that we convert our current readings, which are measured in milliamperes, to our SI unit for current, which is amperes. Let's have another look at the table. Here I've introduced the third column, which will allow us to work out the current measured in our SI unit in amperes. Now remember how we convert milliamperes to amperes. To convert the milliampere to the ampere, we must divide the value by 1000. So let's go and do that on our table. Here we have 10 milliamperes. If we divide 10 by 1000, we will get a value of 0, 0.0110 amperes. Let's repeat that for all the rest. 20 milliamperes gives me 0, 0.020 amperes. The next one, 0, 0.030 amperes. 
0,040 amperes, and finally 50 milliamperes gives me 0,050 amperes. Now that we've got all our values in the correct SI units, let's now do the calculation to work out the ratio between potential difference and current. In other words, V divided by I. Let's have a look at this calculation. If we take the ratio V divided by I, and we take our first reading, where potential difference was 1,5 volts, and we divide it by our current reading of 0 0,10 amperes, we will now get a reading of 150 volts per ampere. I have now recorded that value of 150 volts per ampere into the final column of our table. I've also done the other calculations for the other readings. Let's now have a look at our final column. If we look closely at the ratio of potential difference in current for all of our values, we can see that the values are all fairly close to each other. It looks like this value is almost constant. So what we do now is to calculate an average value of the ratio of V over I. If we take the values of all our ratios of V over I and we add them up and divide it by 5, we will get an average value of 150 volts per ampere. Let's now refer back to our graph of potential difference against current. Can you see now we've got our straight line graph and we have a constant gradient where the gradient is equal to our ratio of V divided by I. Thus both the calculation using the table of results and the graph are showing us that potential difference is directly proportional to the current passing through the resistor. Now let's see how we can write down this relationship mathematically. Watch as I write this on this piece of paper. Well, we know that V is proportional to I. We established that in the previous graph. Now, we can also write down the ratio of V divided by I is equal to a constant, which I'm going to label as K. But we are now going to define that constant as the value R, which is the resistance of the conductor. So therefore, substituting R for K, we can write down R is equal to V divided by I. The relationship between potential difference, current, and now resistance is very helpful in assisting us in designing a circuit or an appliance. George Ohm was the first scientist to investigate this relationship. He formulated the relationship between potential difference, current, and resistance by the following law, known as Ohm's law. Mathematically, he expressed it as V equals I times R, where V equals the voltage, measured in volts, I is the current, measured in amperes, and R is the resistance, measured in ohms. This relationship is only true if the temperature of the conductor remains constant. So we have seen that when certain resistors are placed in a circuit, they obey Ohm's law. That means that there is a direct relation between the potential difference and the current through the resistor. Resistors that obey Ohm's law are said to be ohmic resistors. Right, now that you've learned all about Ohm's law, let's talk about the different types of conductors you get. So you get ohmic and non-ohmic conductors, okay? Ohmic conductors obey Ohm's law. In other words, that there is a, this means there's a constant resistance when the voltage is varied across them or the current through them is increased, okay? So it makes no difference. And they obey Ohm's law. Examples of this are your circuit resistors and nichrome wire. In other words, things that we use as resistors to slow down the current or that we need to do specific tasks within a circuit. They tend to be ohm ohmic conductors, okay? However, you do get things called non-ohmic conductors, which do not obey Ohm's law, okay, obviously. Okay, and what happens? What happens is that they get hot.
and as they get hot their resistance changes okay and a typical example of this is the light bulb specifically the tungsten wire in a light bulb now I know that we are now moving to light bulbs that no longer have this tungsten wire and the part of the reason is because what you don't maybe don't know about this type of light bulb is the light is actually a function a secondary function of the resistance that's going through this. In other words, the aim with this light bulb was to get this piece of metal to get so hot that it gave off light. Okay. Whereas the new versions of light bulbs, which we'll talk about in a different section, actually don't get hot at all. You can touch them even if they've been going for hours and hours. So that is what happens here. In the light bulb, the filament wire, which is usually made from tungsten, gets so hot and as it does its resistance increases dramatically okay and we can see this if we had to plot a graph so on the left here this is a typical ohmic conductor graph which you guys have seen from the rest of the video so yeah we have current and yeah we've got voltage and you can see it's a straight line and the gradient or well, the reverse gradient of volt over amps is going to give us our resistance okay beautiful straight line whereas for a non ohmic conductor okay you can see that this doesn't work the bigger the voltage the current gets less and less and less and the reason for that is because the resistance gets more and more and more so for non ohmic conductor your resistance gets greater because the heat that's given off the temperature is so hot that this graph does no longer obey Ohm's law. And that's it for today. Have a great day.